Hello everyone, my name is Paul, otherwise known as Cuttercross. I'm the creator of The Tower of Turmoil, a game developed with Nestmaker. I'm also a Fama Track composer and a graphic artist, although a lot of you probably already knew that. I guess I'm also now known as the guy who made cutscenes with Nestmaker. <laughs> well, I'm certainly not the first person to make cutscenes with the Nestmaker software, but I believe I am one of the first to create animated Tecmo Theater style cutscenes with Nestmaker, similar to the Ninja Gaiden trilogy on NES. So, if you clicked on this video, you probably saw my other video testing out the new opening cutscene to the Tower of Turmoil. And you're probably wanting to know how I made it. <laughs> I know a lot of people on the Nestmaker forum and the Facebook group have been very enthusiastic about getting some sort of tutorial, so here we go! Before we start dissecting this, we need to ask ourselves, what is a cutscene? What is the bare minimum we need to call something a cutscene? Well, for our purposes, a cutscene is just a scripted series of actions that occur without player input. In fact, we want to flat out ignore player input altogether. Now, you heard me say the word scripted, and you're probably thinking, Oh god, we're going to have to write so much code! No, not at all! In fact, all we're going to need to get a basic cutscene up and running is 8 lines of code. Not even joking. 8 lines. We can handle that, right? Alright, so let's get started. In the Project Settings tab, and Script Settings, maximize this. Also, I apologize for my inconsistent energy in my voice. Commentary is not really my strong suit. Okay, so in, a, in Project Settings tab, Script Settings, I've set up a new AI new AI action called warp, AI Warp to Screen. I've also set up some other AI actions, but those aren't important to us right now. What AI Warp to Screen does is basically the same thing as the Warp to Screen tile type does, but without the check for player collision. So basically, when this AI action is set, it'll automatically warp the player to another screen. This right here is the entire backbone of the entire cutscene system. It's setting this up as an AI action. That's the most important part. Now, let's get to actually dissecting these cutscenes. So the first scene is right here. You can see that the player, when the game starts, is spawning down here at the bottom. And if we take a look at the tile collision, he's surrounded by solid tiles. And the player is spawning on top of a disappear tile. Now, what is that? Now, what is a disappear tile? Well, it's a new tile type I created in Project Settings. So let's go back here. Uh, script Settings. Tile Types. Disappear Tile. Let's take a look at this. Now what this does is that when the player collides with it, it changes the player's action state to 7. Now what does that mean? Well, if we take a look at the player, in his 7th action state, his animation type is cutscene hide. Now what's cutscene hide? Well, if we take a look at the animation I made for him, for that action type, for the action state, it's completely blank. So it basically looks like the player disappears, but he's actually still there in the game. He, his whole sprite is just transparent. So now the player can be hidden during the cutscene while still being there in the game so we have some way to load the next one. Okay. So, what is actually happening in this scene? Well, let's take a look at the video and see what's supposed to happen. Uh, you can see that this is the scene where the main character, well, his name's Takamaru, so I'll just refer to him as that. Takamaru is running in front of the background. Now, how this was done 
it was that I used a monster object. Uh, where is that? Where is that monster object? Here it is. It's a monster object that looks like the player, and I gave him the player's running animation. And I also placed another monster object over that one and lined up the bounding boxes so that when they fall when they fall together they line up perfectly with each other so they can, so it looks like the sprite has more the sprite, the player object has more color now that's great and all that's that's bas that's basically how this is this entire scene works but we s But we still need to find like some way to load the next one. If we take a look at the head object, again, I'm sorry, I am again commentary is not my strong suit. I skip over I skip over my uh my thoughts a lot. If we take a look at the head object, he has six frames of animation. But they're all the same. They're all the same, like, animation frame. Now, why is that? If we go to his action steps, he has an animation speed of 15. And at the end of its animation, it's advancing to the next action step. So what's in the next action step? On a second action step, he has the warp to screen AI action that we set up earlier. So what this is doing is that his animation is acting like a timer. And at the end of that timer, it's warping to another screen. This is this is how we can go to another cutscene after this scene is finished. Of course, you'll need to set up what screen it's warping to in the screen info. So go to screen info. It's warping out to screen 0, 05 which is directly below this one cuz this is 04 and that's basically how the whole cutscene system works it's actually really simple at its core and uses only eight lines of code for the new ai, AI action and the tile type that's all you need to to that's the whole framework you need to make basic cutscenes of course you can build on this system with like new ai actions new tile type new tile types and such and you can make some really dynamic scenes with using this using building on this engine so now that you've seen how the system works let's take a look at the other scenes and talk about how they're made so let's go back to the video now this scene with the legs running back and forth are actually made of four different monster objects. Now, let's take a look at that. I have four monster objects here that are all... that are all... Uh, four sprites wide and four sprites tall. And it's just animating between two animation... between two animation frames. Or... or I'm sorry. It's animate... it's animating between like two different animation frames. The frame count is actually 6 for all these because at the because it's using uh like it's using that same like series of AI action AI actions and action steps that the other scene was based off of. So you can see here like his animation speed is 3 because it has to be that fast to, to give it that animation speed so after that it's advancing to the next action and it's and the next action step is basically a clone of that and the next action step is basically a clone of that and we keep doing that until we hit the warp to screen a action because at that point in time that's when we want to warp to the screen so it's all basically like a big balancing act trying to tweak trying to tweak uh how how many frames you want to animate for, uh, how many action steps you want to you want to use before going on to, to the 
to the next scene. It's all about how you want your timer to act, basically. Okay. So, I guess I should also... I should also answer the question, why four monster objects? Why would why won't you just make one big one big monster object that's eight sprites by eight sprites? Well the problem with that is that Nestmaker has a weird issue where if a monster if one monster object is animating and it's larger than four sprites wide, four sprites tall the the animation will be bugged out or the color palettes can change strangely so you so if you keep it to four s different smaller monster objects everything should work fine and you can still use all 64 sprites and split them among the four monster objects that's why i think that for four four sprite by four sprite monster objects is the is the best way to do this sort of system now, since the since all these leg objects are using sixty four sprites, are using all sixty four sprites, the player doesn't even draw at the bottom. Uh, he would actually be he would actually be like spawning in the same like sort of place. Is here? There's a solid tile here, a solid tile here, a solid tile here, and all of these are solid tiles. And you have your disappear tiles because he's warping right here. He's basically warping, like, the same exact area because, well, I want him to. I guess you could, like, spawn him over here or or some, or some crazy thing like that. But since the... But the player's not even going to draw the bomb because the all the monster objects above it are using all 64 sprites. Which would normally be a bad thing in, like, normal gameplay. But in this case, we don't want the player to draw. So it's actually a good thing. Okay, so that's, that, that's basically this scene explained. Uh, let's go on to the next one. Now this scene, uh, with the with Takamoto's head bobbing up and down as he as he's running, it basically uses the same like sort of uh, four four by four by four sprite monster object uh, approach that we use the legs, except that the sprite itself. The sprites themselves are not actually an are not actually animating between different like animation frames. But but if that's the case, like how is he moving up and down like one pixel? How is he bobbing up and down? Well, instead of animating the sprites moving up and down one pixel, which would be incredibly wasteful, you would basically take up all of your graphic space in that in that uh, monster object bank it's actually working with another tile type so technically this system is using more than eight lines of code but that's just the way I set it I set it up to, to suit my needs because this isn't because this one part isn't really necessary to like move on to the next screen it's use, it's working with another tile type. Down he down here is a row of bounce tile of like t bounce tile types, which is which is something that I set up in project settings and script settings. You can see it's right here. And what this is, this is basically the same this is basically a modified version of the old like trampoline tile type from uh, the nest from the nest maker beta, but it's modif well, it's modified so that any object can interact with this and still and bounce, and it only w and it only bounces one pixel up. You could change this number, make it greater. You could make this number greater, and he would bounce higher. But for my purposes, it looked better with just a one pixel difference. Now, if you, if that's how the head movement works, but if you look closely, in some areas, the head seems to be using more than three colors per sprite. Because you can see, like, take this area, for example. You have black, you have dark green, you have purple, and you have blue, all in the same area, which should be impossible with NES limitations. But here's how it, here's how it was done. The 
face of the head is actually transparent. Uh, you could there's like the rest since the background for since the transparent layer on like the sprite show up as black in the editor, it's not it's not really conveying that there's like black outline here, but whatever. Uh, the face of the head is transparent, and if we get rid of the head, let's just re reset all placements. Let's just get rid of this entirely. You could see that this part of the background is actually what's giving the face its blue color. It's just coming through the transparent area, so that his so that his face looks blue. And the head and back, the head and background are designed perfectly, so it see are lined up perfectly, so that it seems like the head has more color than it actually does. Now, the next scene is similar to the second one, except the legs are actually different monster objects that switch to a stopping animation before going on to the next scene. Like, just like that. They're, once it gets to a certain action step, they just they just change to a stopped uh, animation state, and then and then after that, they, it triggers the warp to screen. Uh, AI action. And the last scene, it looks really complicated with this sort of like big parallax scroll. Well, or parallax mo movement any anyway. If there, uh, since Nesmic, if once like Nesmaker supports like scrolling and animated tiles, this scene would look a lot better. <laughs> but this is what just what I was able to do now. It's actually this scene is actually a lot simpler than it looks. These objects are just moving left and right, left and right respectively, with a very slow speed. So, um, let's look at this. You can see that his normal max speed is just four, and. And the, and for the tower, uh, all of these are just normal max speed of four, so they're just they're just moving very slow. And there's also, if we take a look, there's also a solid line of. There's also a line of solid tiles, uh on like the opposite sides of them. Like there's a line of solid tiles here. There's a line of solid tiles here. So if they start off, if like say this, uh, these objects start off going right instead of going left, it'll just bounce off that object and go left anyway. Same with the tower. If it starts off going left, it'll bounce off and go right. Just to make sure the scene is consistent every single time you boot it up. So, that's pretty much it. Creating cutscenes in Nest Maker is less than a pipe dream than you would think. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, thanks for putting up with uh, my horrible commentary. And uh, leave some feedback down below. Thanks a lot.